welcome back for another helping of oysters, clams, and cockles, bringing you the best TV shows and movies weekly in an easily digestible podcast packed with laughs by me, Ross Bolin, and my dear friend, Mr. Barrett Dudley. Barrett, how goes it on another Wednesday? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm back in the brig here. We are recording. We're both remote. Uh, we haven't had to do this in in many many months. At least one of us has has been in this in the stewed, and um, now we're back to to the to the Stone Age here. Because it's a quarantine life, baby. Because Ross, I was exposed. You've been exposed. Yeah. A, so a flasher, you know, came through uh-huh. with a trench coat, and uh-huh. he opened it up and wiggled his finger through the zipper. And it just so happened that the flasher, while he was exposing me, well, it turns out he had COVID as well. Uh, uh, so I was both exposed uh, and exposed. I was double exposed. It was not a, not a fun experience for me. The double entendre. You never yeah. want that. Um, so it's been about 48 hours since uh, yeah. put put the Jack Bauer ticker up on, okay. up on the screen and do the beep, boop, beep. Boop. Oh, yeah. It's the, it's the yeah. beep, boop, beep, <laughs> Um, about, about 48 hours since, uh, since, since, uh, since contact, since um, contact. Yeah. And, um, n- no symptoms yet. And I-, I feel like from, from what I've read, from what I've heard, the anecdotes, uh, that are out there, uh-huh. day, day three is the real, is the real test. Ah, day now three. Th- this, that's the thing about this, uh, about this, this whore disease, um, is, is that it can take anywhere from like five to 14 days for symptoms to, to show. Um, but my, I'm, I'm sc- scheduled to get tested up on Saturday. Nice. And, uh, and you know, I'm fingers crossed. Hopefully I'm, I, I did not contract this, the, this the vid. The, Fortunately yeah. through the magic of technology, we're able to, uh, the show goes on. It does, uh, which yeah. is nice. I actually did my first COVID test at the end of 2020, right before I went home for Christmas. I did the one where you spit uh, in a in a little in a little bottle over and over, uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, and then ship it off or whatever. And that was fun. And I ended up not having it or whatever. Uh, but yeah, it's. I mean, you know, I, I spoke to this a little bit on my my uh, other show, the Ross Bolin podcast. But it's so funny. Like 2021 started, and there was so much less this year of that whole like. New year, new me. We're all gonna crush. Cause like 2020 <laughs> scared everybody out of that. Cause remember how everybody did that into 2019? Like 2020, new decade. It's fucking time. And then the year dumped all over all of us. And so now I felt like people were gun shy. And I kind of enjoyed New Year's Eve more as a result because it felt it felt less less unrealistic. Like that's always such an absurd premise to me. Like oh yeah, everything's gonna change except your setting and everything else about your life, job general habits you know you make some resolutions that you, you you quit on by march or whatever but generally that's just not the way a new year works and coming into 2021 we're all facing a lot of the same shit we were in 2020 and we started off here on occ with a little quarantine action to remind us that in fact we are yeah still exactly is it it's a it's a very it was a very um yeah kind of humbling experience to like it was i mean it was monday you know his first day back in the back and i just stopped by the office for an hour to to, to yeah. drop off some stuff and look at a few things you know la da la da and then like boom right back 2021 no different it's Flasher the exact runs same in, takes his dick out Flasher we, runs in by the way Barry, you know. i would be remiss if i didn't mention that you know we've been i've been living in austin a decade now you've been here like what how many years 15 would you say that Austin has developed what many would consider to be a homeless problem over the course of those 15 years? It is known. And as a result, we have like a very Los Angeles-y homeless situation at this point. I wouldn't say it's like San Francisco yet, but it's getting weird. And uh, I was at a light the other day on the way to the studio, in fact, and I, I received my first homeless flashing. This gentleman uh, was staring at a line of cars at a red light, and he removed his penis from his pants. Oh, wow. And, sh- and he shook it at us, and it was very unsightly. <laughs> and But it was this moment for me where I was like, now I feel like we're, as a city, like we're really fucked up. Like we're growing yeah. in a way that's fucked up. Now we're yeah. really doing it. Yeah, that, yeah, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a barrier that I've, that I've yet to, uh, to break, thankfully. But yeah, it's not good. Not great. No, it's not. And speaking of homeless flashing, Barrett, this episode of OCC 
is brought to you by <laughs> Echelon. Ah, it, <laughs> perfect segue. You like that tie in there? When it comes to getting or staying in shape, nothing feels as good as that feeling of accomplishment of hitting your fitness goals and feeling great about yourself. Echelon can get you there. Echelon offers the next generation of connected fitness bikes, fitness mirrors, rowing machines, and their all new Stride Smart treadmill. No matter what your favorite fitness activity, Echelon gives you a fun and challenging workout from the comfort of home. Their world-class instructors will motivate you with thousands of daily live and on-demand studio-level classes. They're always available when you need them. And unlike their competitors, Echelon is affordable for everyone. And one membership lets up to five family members all work out at the same time. Right now, Clam Fam, you can try Echelon Fitness Equipment at home for 30 days when you go to echelonfit.com slash dragon. That's E-C-H-E-L-O-N fit.com slash dragon to try any echelon uh, fitness equipment at home for 30 days all right now it's time for everybody's favorite segment tidbits and such with Barrett. yeah well you know we're talking about uh we're talking about breaking barriers we were talking about uh just all sorts of you know new things happening and so i've got some i've got some tids and some bits here uh, uh, mm. that that are are related to these new things that are happening in the uh, in the in the industry in the entertainment world huzzah um let me first start with the uh the hbo max warner brothers this is the first right we've talked at length about how they're they're the first big studio they're the ones saying Starting on Christmas Day 2020 and going through 2021, we're just dropping the new movies right there on your streaming service for you to enjoy. Well, Ross, I did this. I enjoyed a, uh, a big budget blockbuster that I should have been in a theater to see right from the comfort of my very own couch. Um, have, you watched, have you watched Wonder Woman 84 yet? Um, no. And it's interesting to me that you would put yet on the end, seeing as that you've seen it and are, are clearly aware of... Uh the reception it is receiving. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you know, it's a, it's right. We, th this is one of the questions. I if this movie is just available on your streaming service, you're probably more likely to watch it. So, so even though you, I, I might not expect you to go drop a, a you know, a fat stack uh, at the draft house to, to right. watch this thing with your lady, you might flip it on uh, since it's just right there at, at your fingertips. Now, here's the thing. Ironically, I went and saw the first one in theaters, Wonder Woman, mm -hmm. and I loved it. I thought it was awesome. Um, or wait, did I watch it in theaters? Doesn't matter. Wherever I watched it, it does matter. It wasn't in theaters. It was at home. Um, <laughs> but I thoroughly enjoyed it. Really liked the first one. So I was kind of stoked for the second one. And then obviously very excited because this was one of the big releases that we knew was going to go straight to streaming. And then it came out and was immediately being panned in a way that's not like, not like critics being like, yeah, there wasn't enough. Yeah, not that. It was like regular ass people being like, that sucked. And I became uninterested in the film as it were. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's kind of a hot mess disaster of a movie. Um, okay, tell and, us why. Tell us about it, Barrett. And it's it's um, well, let let me let me get my broken record out here. Okay, are you ready? Okay, is it very long? It is so long. It is way way too long. Look, I I, I don't know how many times I have to say this, right? and and I know that at this point, studio heads and writers and directors are hearing this. Right. But your movie does not need to be two and a half hours long unless it is some auteur masterpiece, unless you, unless you are Christopher Nolan or Quentin Tarantino or Terrence Malick and you are making fucking gold. Like, your movie does not need to be a, 191 minutes or whatever, man. There seems to be a general lack of self-awareness in Hollywood where it's like, I don't think people who have the ability to recognize that they're not in that class. Like, and I'll add one more to your list. If it stars Daniel Day-Lewis, you're allowed to do whatever uh, for <laughs> however long because it's just, that's the way he rolls. But yeah, man, it, it, this has become, at this point, it's like, it's even more obvious. Look, everyone in the content game which Hollywood is a part of, the content game, understands that, that attention spans are not what they once were. Like, we all stopped writing columns at some point earlier in, in several years ago because people were like, listen, guys, uh, we don't read. Nobody knows how to read anymore. <laughs> we don't even know how to read these words. This is all nonsense. And we were like, oh, shit, so we're going to have to make, like, 
shorter videos or whatever. It's just completely insane to me that they're like, you know what we'll do? We'll make these movies three hours long just because. <laughs> and on top of that, it makes them so much pricier to go that length for them yeah. to produce. And it, it, it just, it's, that's the first sin because it, it allows, when you give a movie that much time, it allows it to get bloated and it allows like the plot to spin out of control. And you, yeah. and it's just the tighter your movie is, the more likely it is for the mistakes to kind of be overlooked or swept under the rug because the pacing is usually more positive. Right. With a with a movie that's an hour thirty to two hours long, yeah, you don't get you don't loaded. you don't get those opportunities to kind of get like once you start stretching out this movie, you're allowing me to start thinking more about the dumbass plot holes, about the r terrible storylines that you chose, about the um the the meaning or lack thereof of certain characters that don't even belong in this movie because they're pointless, um just just like all that stuff. It's like you. You, you put this in a, a movie that's two hours and 40 minutes long or whatever. And I got a lot more time to start thinking about that. Now, the, the, you know, the twist here, the, the, the connection to, to this being released in a new format is that this is even more like emphasized because we're on our couches with our phones in our hands. Right. And we're so not, we, and, and we're, we're not having a theater experience. We're not getting the message from the draft house at the beginning to like, you know, keep our phones in our pocket and shut the hell up or we're getting kicked out. Right. Like, so, yeah, a so, lot of people are watching this, getting a text message from like a hottie <laughs> hitting pause and going and having a sesh before they come. And it's like, that's not the way it would have been in theaters. You're exactly so, right. Uh, it, it's unfortunate for a lot of reasons because I really like Gal Gadot as uh, Wonder Woman and this movie stars two other people uh, that I'm really excited to see in a major motion picture. Uh, Kristen Wiig as a villain, no less, and Pedro Pascal as kind of like our big bad. Now, right. I, while it's difficult for me to recommend this movie, like, yes, you should go spend two and a half hours to watch it. Pedro Pascal's like hyper manic, crazy, hamming it up performance in, a, in an insane wig is almost worth it. He he very much is like close to saving the movie because he is so on one, and and some of his funnier, more poorly written lines like "No, no, your dad is a pretty messed up loser guy," um, just hit different. Uh, <laughs> cue up the uh, the SWAT loser. Yeah, dude, the way he talks, um, so something about it is like I've noticed this on Mandalorian. There can be like a dumbass line where because he says things, he has this very specific delivery. It kind of makes things have an element of humor to him when they're stupid. Yeah, yeah. So um, it, it it was it, it was kind of a bummer because it it had people that I like and characters that I like. Uh, what one of the things that I've I've learned since watching the first movie, the first film, which I think you and I both enjoyed quite a bit, mm -hmm. was written by one by one person. Okay. One person had a good idea for the script. They wrote the whole thing. They're credited with the script. This movie was written by three or four people, including the director Patty Jenkins, who only directed the first one. Got it. And so it it, it you you learn that and you start to get this feeling that there's like potentially too many cooks in the kitchen on this. Yeah. And then it, it, when you bring in more people, they want to do more things. And so there's like, there are clear references to the original TV show in this movie. Oh, wow. Uh, one, one involving an invisible jet, which is one of the dumber moments in the film. Uh, and, and it's just like, it's just bloated, man. You can tell that they, they all had something that they wanted crammed in and it, it just did not work. And it's unfortunate too, because the, the, the eighties scenery is great. Um, the, the, the atmosphere is still good. This movie did not try to be like connected to a bigger world. Like it, it's not setting up the next justice league movie. It's not directly tied into like a bunch of, you know, DC extended universe bullshit. And so it, it, you know, it should have had a lot of things going for it. And I don't know what happened along the way, but it is, it, like I said, it's, it's very much a hot mess. You know what I was, dude, on this exact same topic. Okay. So it's, it's kind of a random aside, but it's also very connected. 
I watch Bad Santa over Christmas because I love Bad Santa, one of my favorite Christmas movies. We bring it up every time we talk about holiday movies. It's fucking hilarious to me. The combination of like the Christmas holiday spirit and this very, very crude, absurdly terrible person played by Billy Bob Thornton. Um, well, I watched the director's cut. Okay. Okay. And it was several minutes longer, you know, like I'd say a good 15 minutes longer, maybe. And it was specifically the director was upset with the way the studio had cut the film. He thought they made it more friendly, audience friendly and like less crude and upsetting, I guess. Um, so everything that was added back in for the director's cut was essentially like overkill, I would I would say. I would say the studio made the right decisions. The director is a psycho and was like trying to make it way unnecessarily longer. And it was just they cut it beautifully. The OG version is I mean, not the OG version, but the theater version is the version that you should be watching. And it just sort of made me think about that whole process and like how that must go. And really with stu it's like the same problem that happens with like small businesses when, you know, people are unwilling to give up power, basically, uh, to people who know what they are doing, um, to bring in like somebody who actually knows what they're doing to make sure things go the way they're supposed to. And I feel like it's like a comparable situation where it, sh it should be somebody outside of the project that is given the final edit, like to cut what should stay, what should go. Cause there's no bias there. And it's not somebody being like, well, this was my idea. Like, let's get this idea. And what about my, you know what I mean? Cause that's how you end up with all this extra fluff and shit that we don't want. Well, and we're, we're usually, you know, it we're usually very pro creator, right? Like we want directors and writers and actors to kind of like be able to dig in and, and do what they want to do and like express sure. their creativity and their creativity and like get across their vision. And that is important in certain types of films, TV shows and to be and, sure. Yes. And types of media. But when you're dealing with a movie like bad Santa, which is supposed to be, a funny holiday movie or Wonder yeah. Woman 84, which is supposed to be a super broad and enjoyable superhero flick. Thing, like it's like, let's get this thing as tight like, as possible. Yeah. The, those are, the, those are our instances where it's like, sometimes those studio notes are actually really important because they know, they, they kind of know what they're doing. They, they know how to make this movie broad. And that's a very fine line to walk because it, we're not saying that we want things dumbed down and, 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 you know, push, short the, as possible, push to the right? lowest common denominator. But at the same time, it's it, it's like not everything calls for like what you're saying, like this, you know, this big bad director's cut. Like, right. Le it's... Let me turn let me turn this movie, which is not all that profound into what I think it is, which is like this great, intense piece of art. Well, no, it's not, man. You know what and I mean? And I would compare it to like, you know how every player in the NBA, like you, you won't, you'll hear from a vet like Charles Barkley is, is one of the guys that I, I love a lot and respect a lot. Chuck, uh that we watched growing up as a kid. And when you'll hear him talk about his game now, he'll say stuff like, he'll say, I thought I was the best player in the world. My whole career, like actually for him, it was up until this one game where he literally played like his best game of his career. It was in the last dance, I think, and he still lost to Jordan. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, but it's like that, I feel like with movie makers, they're like, I am the best, like everybody thinks they're the best artist in the world. And like, as a as a creative guy, Look, I get that, like, you want to get everything in there. You want to get all your ideas in there. And, but, like, it is so helpful to have a fresh set of eyes from somebody who can be like, hey, man, like, this is really good, but this is unnecessary. Or, like, you don't need this for this to work. And, like, that's where I feel like these directors, these, a lot of these uh, writers, creatives, whoever these showrunners are, in some cases for TV, they refuse to, like, let anybody help them with that sort of situ with that sort of thing. So we end up with a few t episodes too many when it's TV shows. We end up with... 40 minutes too much movie when it's a movie it's just like it seems like it's a hubris and ego thing more than anything else and right. probably one of the more exp expensive examples that occurs regularly that i can come up with yeah well uh gal and patty jenkins the director uh are, are already signed on to return for a third so I, I hope that they use the opportunity to kind of uh steer back onto the course because it's a fun character and the, the films should be better than than the second one was. I mean, and that was the hottest female superhero franchise we've ever seen take root in the in the form of the first movie in the in the modern day movie era. Anyway, I'm trying to think of another one. I, I can't. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, there really there there haven't been many. Um, but I I think comparatively, if we're if we're just going on kind of off word of mouth and reviews, Wonder Woman was certainly uh, more highly thought of than Captain Marvel. That's uh, good. But uh, I next one up is Black Widow, which which um, is coming to theaters at some point in 2021, and looks like it could be great. But we'll have we'll have to see. And that is the one starring. Scarlett Johansson, Scarlett Johansson, David Harbour, Rachel Weisz, and Florence Pugh. So really top-notch cast, all playing like weird Russian superheroes. Looks and, like and, RDJ and David Har- You said David Harbour, right? Yeah, it could, could be very, very cool. Um, right okay, so I'm going to move on because we're continuing to break down barriers here. Uh, Let's do in, it. In t- today in Tidbits. Huge. Um, what if I told you? What if I told you? Mm. That uh, the director of Vice and The Big Short, Adam McKay, was directing a movie starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence. Oh. And, th- and that this movie was going straight to Netflix. Oh, wow. That would be very exciting news. I, I-, I feel like this is... Um, you know, we just keep, we keep pushing, we keep pushing, we keep pushing. And I know Brad Pitt has done a Netflix movie and I think maybe George Clooney has, and like we had Roma last year and we have Mank this year, but those are like little artsy films. This is like, I I saw, I didn't even know that Leo and and J-Law were starring in a movie together until I saw like some paparazzi shots a day or two ago. It's very exciting. Two of my favorite people, two of my favorite actors. Uh, I I love that they're working together on a film. The Big Short is one of my favorite movies of all time. I love Adam McKay. I think he's brilliant. So this is very, very exciting. And I'm looking up like what this movie is about. It's a Netflix film. It's coming to Netflix. And the um, the plot oh. is interesting as well. It is considered an American political satire disaster film. Um, and... The uh, the the just the the low level headline here. The film includes an ensemble cast led by Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence, who portray two low level astronomers attempting via a media tour to warn mankind about an asteroid that will destroy Earth. Yeah, this says this says it falls to astronomers who set on a media tour to warn the public that a a uh, meteor will destroy Earth in just six months. So we're, we're, I think that we're going to, you know, Adam McKay, certainly with the big short was kind of like showing us a, that's a disaster film of a sort, right? And it's kind sure. of um, reevaluating like all of the signs that were there. So this feels very much like it's going to deal with climate change to me. Um, and that's not surprising coming from the creators or the star Leonardo DiCaprio. But just listen to this. Much like Big Short had lots of different cameos and was kind of an ensemble cast as well. Yep. Here's who else is in this movie. Kate Blanchett, Jonah Hill, Timothy Chalamet, Ariana Grande, Kid Cudi, and Matthew Perry, as well as Tyler Perry and Ron Perlman, as well as Chris Evans. And so- <laughs> Meryl Streep and Rob Morgan and Tomer Sisley. I do not know who those last two people and, are. That's why I didn't name And them. Himesh Patel. I also left him out. But what oh, about yes. Meryl Mer- Streep? You know who I, Meryl Streep is. I, I, I do. I looked over her name here on the uh, on the list. That's, I heard um, if you forget to mention Meryl's name in a movie she's in, she comes and strikes you dead in the sli- when you're sleeping. Uh, if Meryl wants to come hang out in the house, uh, I'm okay with whatever is the result. Okay. So, uh, yeah, just th- th- there's there's all sorts of shots right now. They're, they're filming in Boston, um, but the, 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 the it's set in New York, so they're... They're turning Boston into New York. Uh, the, bo- the the people in Boston can't be happy about that. And yeah, yeah it's really actually just, there's there's some funny photos and I think it's people of the bo- the set of bo- the New York set in Boston, and it is very weird. Like the yeah yeah. I mean first first right Tom, first Tom Brady leaves and 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 the 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 Patriots suck now and the the Bucks are going to. Uh, are going to the playoffs and they're going to beat the shit out of the the Tampa, the the Washington football team. Yeah. And now this, now they're now they're using Boston and to turn this. it into New York. God. Yeah, this is an interesting the, the injustices, man. They just they won't quit. Sorry to to all the the beanheads out there. 
Yeah, it's terribly sad for you and your 46 <laughs> championship trophies, all of you in the Northeastern area. Uh, this is an interesting move for Leo, though. Like, I get, I get this. I see it for everybody else involved. I, I understand it, even for Merrill. Um, but and then it just seems like. Yeah, look, Leo seems like a guy that wouldn't do a Netflix movie no matter yeah. what. And Adam McKay is sort of like, all right, so his run through is crazy. Like his his. It's Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy that he directed, Talladega Nights he directed, Step Brothers, uh, Anchorman 2, doesn't matter, nobody cares. Also, obviously, 2018's Vice, 2015's The Big Short. That's a lot of really successful, really, really high, like he's one of like the great directors and writers in Hollywood right now. And to do a Netflix film... Like, we're in this weird place. I feel like everybody's trying to figure out, like, what the hell? How do we operate Hollywood-wise now? What is the movie theater situation? It's it's an interesting move, man. It's like, it's he's, he's one of these guys that's kind of stepping out with this project. And for Leo to be a part of it and, and for it to be a straight-to-streaming is like, you and me talk about how all the time. Leo is one of the most well-manicured brands in terms of A-list celebrity actors ever. Yeah. And look, man, Netflix signs guys like Adam Sandler to $200 million deals and shit. That's what they do. They don't work with the A-list, A-list, best actors in the world. Guy just finally got his Academy Award, and now he's like, fuck it, I'll do a Netflix movie. It's just uh, bizarre. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they've got Brad Pitt before. He, Brad, like, I, like I mentioned, Brad Pitt has done one of these. Um, I... I but Leo honestly sits in almost a class above. He he. This yeah. is the guy that is notoriously reclusive and like d- it is the most private uh, ab- about his private life. M- outside of, I, I guess there's okay. I guess there's the tippy 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 top, which is Daniel Day Lewis. Sure, where and then yeah. l- and and who is who is just a freak show, just man. a real freak artist. You know, retired already. Yeah. Then right below that is Leo. Who who is so conscious of, uh, about privacy and about about brand image and about um, the the roles that he chooses? This is this like we've mentioned. This is the one guy basically that the interviews met, he'll give that has that, and that hasn't budged on 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 securing the bag via a Marvel Marvel movie. Real quick, other tidbits here. I don't know if we've mentioned this, but Christian Bale is signed on to play the uh, the villain in the next Thor movie. The Thor Love and Thunder, the one that where Natalie Portman becomes Thor. What in the fuck? And that, and I believe that that role was offered to Brad Pitt first, if I'm not mistaken. Did you just say Natalie Portman? Yeah, the female. The we got female f- Thor coming in. There's like a whole thing. It's the hammer. Whoever holds the hammer. Blah blah blah. Um. So, right. She's so, like so- five two. <laughs> What did she get a swing? With it's gonna be tight. It's gonna be tight. I'm on right, the board okay. of that one too. All right, all right. I, you, you guys know me. I'm not not superhero movie guy, but that one I'm very very interested in as well. Um. So yeah. So right. Like 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 everybody eventually folds. Right. They see okay. that they they see that number on the check from Disney, and they're like, all right, right. It can only help me long term, long run, to go be in this Marvel movie. Right. Yeah. It's going to be easy. I'm just going to be in front of a green screen the whole time. And they're going to like, and they're cutting me this check for like $47 million. And, and, uh, I'll, I've got to say like seven lines. And I get some um, back end and it's going to sell right, till the right. end of time. And yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah. But, it's an e- easy but, decision. But like Leo's never going to do a superhero movie ever. He won't. Which is why it doesn't make sense. Like, so, so I this... would almost rather him get to do a badass dark superhero movie than like a random. I mean, look, don't get me wrong. This could end up being incredible. But like you, we just spoke to some of the issues with this straight to streaming thing. It can be it can very much affect the experience of a film. Like, absolutely. And I'm way things play out in a movie where that's your only focus and no phones, Barrett, like you were saying, like, bro, that is a totally different world. Yeah. So if your movie can't hit under like the home circumstances, which isn't really a predictable thing yet, I don't think we don't know all the angles. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, the yeah, the, the successful tough. the successful home watching movies are, are like we've talked about. They're kind of throwaway fare. That's like good and maybe a little bit thought provoking, but fun and kind of you know you don't have to worry about them. It's Palm Springs. It's American yes. Pickle. It's yes. it's 
you know, it's this other that's stuff God, that's it's, just, it's happiest season. It's you again, know, it's, American pickle. Please do not. Please do not. Just don't. It's just just don't. It's it's too. It's so long and bad. <laughs> just don't. But yes, it's like I thought you Palm liked Springs. American pickle. I thought you were oh, a pickle. I thought you were a pickle boy. I'm not a pickle boy. I, I love Palm Springs. I thought that was awesome. And, and that's a perfect like that was the perfect 2020 movie that fit into the new world of streaming and was good enough to be like respectable talked about but like people aren't going and streaming like some crazy life-changing fucking drama that's three hours long and half the cast dies and then calling up all their buddies to tell them about it that's just not the world we live in right now so i'm curious to see where this lands in the ter- in terms of like societal yeah commentary it's, it's, it's slightly worrisome right that it's that it's, it's a netflix movie you see all those people involved you see adam mckay directing like you 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 read the plot and you're like man th- this this sounds really fun and good I, it's kind of a shame that you won't have a theater experience for that that you won't be forced to put your phone away that you that it you know, strikes that, me that, as that, one that of you won't movies. have a communal experience while watching it yeah it strikes me as one of those movies barrett that you like you see it coming up and you're like, damn, that cast is crazy. Like, mm-hmm. oh, Adam McKay, that's pretty exciting. Straight to Netflix. Wow, that's different. And then like six months pass and nobody ever brought it up. And you're like, yeah, wait, yeah. what the hell happened with that movie with Leonardo yes. DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence? Like that's how did we not end up talking about that? It feels like it could end up slotting in there. So fingers crossed that it doesn't because I'm not trying to see Leo take that kind of weird L. Yeah, seriously. Um, yeah, but some, something to keep your eye on, something to look forward to. Right on. Uh, okay. The final thing that I have here is really, really sliding the, down into the such here. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. less so more, let more, less than it's not really a tit or a bit. It's more of a such. Okay. Um, we record twice a week. We talk about TV, movies, entertainment, industry. We watch we a ton of, sh- we watch a ton of shit. Despite that, I don't generally make blanket recommendations to our friend group. Right. I rarely, I, I listen to what they're watching and, and hear what other people have to say, but I, 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 there's a very, each of each of them, each of our close friends, and, and you know the, the group chat that I'm talking about, of course, ha- have specific tastes, I would say. Very much so. You know? And so it's, it's not often that I'm like, everybody should go watch this, especially with a TV show that requires far more of a time commit than, commitment than movies. Right. Um, I've now wrapped up season one of FX Hulu's What We Do in the Shadows based on the 2014 film show run by Jermaine Clement and Taika Waititi. And th- this might be Pantheon level comedy. I-, I cannot recommend this show enough. I did not say this part in the group chat because I didn't want to oversell it. Okay. But when I'm, tr- when I'm trying to think of what this show reminds me of, mm-hmm. it's like, it's kind of everything that I love. I see thing. I see that there are pieces of it that are very arrest development. There are pieces of it that are very, uh, the office. There's a little bit of curb your enthusiasm. Yep. There is, uh, even some, uh, like Borat, like, but the good part of Borat, not, yeah. not the insane dumb part of Borat. Yeah. Uh, and it all, and then it's also on top of that, it's kind of got this like dry, like kind of British wit about it too. Uh, or, or I guess in this it case, it's, does. it's, it's New, Ze- New Zealand wit. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I'm not sure what country Kiwi it wit. is, but somewhere wit. But uh, I, yeah, so this is the first show that I've just made a blanket recommendation to that group of friends in I don't know how long. Probably, yeah, since, probably since Game of Thrones. <laughs> it's a group of friends um, where if you're off, if you're off, you're going to get roasted. You will also get shredded, yes. Yeah. And it's <laughs> it's also one that's like, we are all very acutely aware of each other's tastes and we're all like definitely um, entertainment snobs on some level. And it's just a risky place to throw one out. Yeah, you're kind of scared to make a recommendation, honestly. Like, <laughs> here's the thing, here's the thing. I watched this movie, the 2014 What We Do in the Shadows film, several years ago just sort of a random i even think i mentioned it on the show it was like a random fucking um weekend i found it on wherever it was streaming and i was like yo i love vampire shit this looks hilarious i'm gonna watch it and it was so funny very very funny very enjoyable and i I didn't really know much about any of this squad at that point what td any of the dudes um but and it was sort of a i, I thought maybe it was because like i tend to have a little bit weirder taste a sense of humor 
And I thought maybe it was just one of those things where it was funny to me and like nobody really watched it. And I don't know. We just didn't talk about it that much. I, it never really was like a thing that I went back to. I never really recommended it to anybody. I was just like, that was a random thing I watched that I really liked. I was stoked on the concept of the TV show, but I needed like a push in to, to something to get me over the line to make me watch it. And so when you finally suggested it to the friend group, I was like, yep, that's it. I'm in. And I watched the first one that night and I watched the second one yesterday. And I am so fucking excited for the rest of the season. <laughs> uh, it is ho- so hysterical. Yeah. It's very short and quick. It, yeah, 22 it, minute episodes. You know what? I couldn't put my finger on what it was about this show that made it really like it's just so fun. And it's the vibe they took from the movie, too. And it really is that it's a very cool combination of a lot of these different elements that we love about these different things like The Office, like Borat, like uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. A lot of these different types of humor that have worked, these really eclectic humors that have worked in different places all combined. And it's it's like it's weird and almost like dork comedy at times, but also very clever and witty at times. And it's it is like, how do I put this? It's very self-aware and cool and like just well, everything about it is great so far through two episodes. And I love that they took the the. The movie and we're able to say like we can kind of we could do more with this vibe and take this and make it into a great tv show because this thing and now that you're telling me what you're thinking of it after you finish season one um it has a ton of potential uh and i'm i'm so excited to get through it because i needed something that was a little like i haven't had a my comedy that i could just turn to whenever yeah other than Shit's Creek, but right? Shit's Creek, it, yeah, yeah. That was sort of like it felt like it was it was everybody's show. Like by the time I got to it, everybody was already on it. It wasn't like you know what I mean. So I, it's been a minute since I could get in early enough um, to watch a show. But there are three fucking seasons already. Is the next thing I found out. Like I feel like yeah. After I finished episode one, I googled it and I was excited. Like oh yeah in at the ground floor and then i saw three seasons out already and i was like how huh now there are only are, are there three or maybe there are two seasons out that's yeah and yeah season I think there are three is coming out. i'm sorry season three is coming this year 2021 yes. yeah yeah there you go yeah and we're the, the good news is that we're, that we're not too terribly far behind on this season no. two came out 20 in 2020 okay um and, and we and, can burn through these they're so and, fast. oh I, I we watched the first season very very quickly i want to say in like two weeks maybe 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 less than that um can you answer I, a question for me without it being a spoiler you'll have to hear it before you know okay okay can you tell me who your favorite vampire ends up being by the end of season one? Oh, it's very easy it's nadia okay cool she she, she curious, is, as i watch now she she i mean they're all great like and and this is not to take away from anybody in the cast like every single character makes me laugh out loud um but nadia is kind of like she she gets she gets most of the the jim halper like deadpans to the camera yeah which are always really really funny um but she's also just kind of the most uh, uh, electric on screen a uh-huh. little bit and it, I've been is, loving her husband so far, man. Laszlo but yeah, is- I'm, Laszlo is 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 awesome. Um, and yeah, Nandor, I, I mean, the energy vampire, Chris Robinson, uh, Robinson, like they, this. It's just really, really smart and really, really funny. That's a great concept. That when they introduced in episode one, I was like, oh, okay. So yeah. that was that was the first time, it, like that, it, it went off in my head, like, oh. Okay, so I see how they saw that they like they finished the movie, watched the movie, and were like, "Holy shit!" Now we have all these other ideas we want to implement, and that one is incredible—the energy vampire. And then he's like, <laughs> he's explaining that he's the most—they're the most common kind of vampire. And I love his Jim Halpern looks. He'll give the camera after he just sucks the fucking uh-huh, life out yeah. of somebody, dude. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> awesome, awesome show so far. So thank yeah. you for for getting me over the hump. Yeah, it was just I, I had to bring it up again because it's been a while since I just had a show that I could just be like, yes, you need to watch. All of you need to this watch. This is a this. winner. This is a winner. It's a, yeah. it's, it's a winner, and um, yeah, it's just great, man. So yeah, that was the last thing I wanted to make sure we talked about today, since you had you had brought it up and got me to watch it finally. What we do in the shadows? Um, again, it's on Hulu, but it's one of those FX on Hulu's. Yeah, I think it's an FX show. 
that is now maybe an FX on Hulu show. I, I don't know. There's really, there doesn't seem to be a difference between the two at this point, because I even if it's, I, even I if no it's clue. just, even if it's just on FX, I, I think that it's one of those things where it, it, that means it's like on Hulu the next day. Got you. Okay. So I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, whatever that, it is. I know you can watch it on Hulu. Cause that's you can I'm watch it on it. Hulu. Yeah. Um, um, really enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. The last thing I was going to, I was going to ask you about is you, you haven't happened to watch this heaven's gate documentary. Have you? No, it's one that I'm on board okay. for though. All right. So I, I listened to the podcast, the heaven's gate podcast a few years back. Okay. Um, and it was like, it, it was very clearly, uh, inspired by serial as many of the kind of true crime and like human interest cult podcasts were at that point. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, like, only serial had really, really figured out the format, like, right. you know, had it super brushed up and polished. And so the podcast was, was okay. It was interesting, but it wasn't, wasn't perfect. This is this, this documentary, which is available on HBO max is four parts each, uh, a little under an hour. And you get the same, you get the same thing that you do from the podcast, which was like eight or nine episodes and, and, and more of a commitment. Plus having the visual is, is really nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, if you if if you watch Heaven's Gate, we can come back to it. Otherwise, it's just kind of a if you're into cults and you like the the, the cult docu series type stuff, it, worth a watch. This is one it's pretty quick. This is that I honestly bared. I don't know a whole lot about I, every. I I know it's one that's involved with the UFO stuff, but I don't know much about Heaven's Gate as a cult. Um, so I'm absolutely going to be watching it in the next few weeks at some point, and when I do, I'll make sure to circle back to it. Oh, I yeah, didn't realize right on. there's a a Houston tie-in somewhere here. There the, is, yeah, the yeah, there is. Huh? Huzzah! Right on. Well, everybody, go watch what we do in the shadows. If you got nothing else from today's show, you should take that away from it. What have uh, What have you been been um, been using your time to uh, to consume, Ross? Um, I'm doing Mando still. I'm almost done with season one. Okay, it's been awesome. There's, I have really no general anything to add to it other than what we've already talked about when we went through it, when you finished. Um, I haven't gotten any of the, the, the big, big stuff yet that I'm excited to see unfold on screen. And other than that, uh, I've continued watching broad city. It continues to be hysterical. If you never dove into that, another very short, if you coupled broad city with, with what we do in the shadows to end every day, you'd go to bed <laughs> in a good mood. That's very true. Yeah. Which is honestly like, those are the, at this point, I'm trying to like get as many of these as I can, man. Like, mm -hmm, cause mm -hmm. we're going to need them. We needed them last year and I didn't have enough. Uh, so I'm, I'm making sure I get stocked up, but yeah, I haven't, I haven't d dove into any of the really like new stuff yet. Um, I've mostly been keeping an eye on, you know, like HBO max had a ton of other shit from our childhood get put up on there. Mm -hmm. Uh, I went through all their Turner classic movies lists last night. So they have all these, these, uh, groupings, you know, of different brands they've purchased or gotten rights to, to put on the HBO max deal or that they just own. Um, maybe they own all of them. I don't know. But one of them that they brought in was Turner Classic Movies. They added a bunch of Cartoon Network stuff. And okay. then like old school shit like uh, Dexter's Laboratory and stuff when, from when we were little kids. So it's it's really starting to get more competitive with all these other streaming services at a faster rate than I thought they would, which is sort of what happened with Disney Plus at the beginning, too. I was like, I don't know how they're going to continue to keep up. And then they've just put out so much content that I'm like, oh, okay. Um, but HBO Max has become certainly a top three streaming platform for me at this point. It's in my top two, three that I go to every time I'm trying to find something. Whereas mm -hmm. HBO Go back in the day was very much like, yeah, oh, I mean, it was just HBO. Some specific and right. or like see what movies they had for this this quarter, you know, so they've really done a lot to move the ball there. Good for them. And it only took them uh, horrendously blowing all of the launch and firing two of their executives and <laughs> and, and and failing to uh, capitalize on uh, several other instances of uh, possibilities. So anyway, that's all I got for today, though. If you don't have anything else, sir, that's it, man. That 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 wraps it up for me. Um, yeah, excited kinda, to watch the Sopranos a... this week. Oh, very, very much. I I saw I saw our our Instagram post. Um, uh, you said that uh, stuff starts getting real this week. Yeah. So, you know, not necessarily sure what that means, but, um, but I, res but I respect that you said it. Good. 
That's good. <laughs> yeah, I said. I look. I said things heat up. This they week. heat up. They and, heat up. Um, yeah. And they do. They do. Things heat up a bit. I'll just say that episode six of season one of The Sopranos, Pax Soprana. Barrett and I are going to be covering on patreon.com slash oysters, clams, cockles this week with everybody who's watching and enjoying season one of The Sopranos with us right there in the Mollusk Militia and the Crustacean Nation. If, if you're new here, if somehow you missed it at the end of last year, we just started this project on Patreon to take on The Sopranos. Barrett had never watched it. I've seen it several times, so it's friendly to both rewatchers and first timers. Spoiler free every week, episode by episode. You get one podcast per episode. We're just over the halfway point of season one this week, going into episode six. Like I said, Pack Soprano, that episode, a uh, podcast episode, will drop this Thursday afternoon. So you got more than enough time to catch up right now. If you still want to take season one down, jump in P A T R E O N, patreon.com slash oysters, clams, cockles. Episode six dropping this Thursday. Yeah, it's not a bad idea to to I mean I mean you're definitely here's why you're not too late because I know that we have a lot of listeners and a lot of members of the uh, Crustacean and Nation Crustacean and Nation and Mollusk Militia that that have not been able to restrain themselves and they've just gone ahead and and continued to 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 watch episodes. They're just so burning through, yeah. If if you jump on right now, chances are you're going to uh, catch up very quickly. And then you'll be along for the ride and maybe you'll even get out in front of us, but that that's okay. You know, it's, it's, um, it's your choice and we will not judge you one way or the other, uh, for how fast you watch, but we are going, not. we are going one week at a time Wednesday nights. That's the Sopranos night, you know, for both of us, Barrett and I, yes, we've been watching yes. every Wednesday night. It's every nice Wednesday to have a dedicated night. night. Um, that's when I get the, uh, I go to the freezer, I get out the big ZD, I get a little red wine. Oh yeah. And then I give myself communion. <laughs> and then I watch The Sopranos. Oh, I bet you do. <laughs> Slip yourself a wafer, do you, Barrett? What'd you do? Play Name the Pope with yourself? Name that Pope? That's ex- it's exactly right. That's the, right. Uh, that's the pregame for The Sopranos. A little round of Name that Pope. Yeah, so y'all come through patreon.com slash oysters, clams, cockles. Barrett and I have thoroughly enjoyed everything we've uh, gotten to do on there with y'all so far. I wrote another, uh, wrote another column over the weekend called The Humanity of Tony Soprano that I posted for all the members of the Mollusk Militia to read. Having a blast on Patreon and going to be doing it all 2021. So all 2021, come through patreon.com slash oysters, clams, cockles for all the Sopranos content you can handle. Come get some of this hot gabagool. <laughs> Can't believe I made myself say that. Uh, follow us on social media for updates on all the best in TV and film. And when the podcast drops or has changes or whatever, we're on Instagram at Oysters, Clams, Cockles, Twitter at Clams and Cockles, Facebook.com slash Oysters, Clams, Cockles. I am Ross Bolin, and you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at WR Bolin at W-R-B-O-L-E-N and listen to my other show, the Ross Bolin podcast, where we focus on mental health and comedy Mondays and Wednesdays, wherever you listen to OCC, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube.com slash Bolin Media, which is where you can watch every episode of this podcast uh, that you are currently listening to, if you would like to, on YouTube.com slash Bolin Media. Mr. Dudley, where can we follow you on the social mediums? Check me out, Twitter and Instagram, at Barrett Dudley, B-A-R-R-E-T-T-D-U-D-L-E-Y. Hmm. That's I it. like when people spell things. I probably spelled that way too fast, but I thought you, you can just speech. you can just hit the you can hit the fifteen second button and just yeah. and then and 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 listen on your very, pen and very, paper and try listen again. very listen very closely. Yeah, it's like you when can, you're taking you can, down a a, a a phone number from a voicemail and you have to keep rewinding it over and over. That, right, idiot. right. That's that that's a that's the tip of the day. If you need to leave your phone number on a voicemail, make sure you do make sure you say the number slowly so that people don't have to do that. Yeah. Eight, four, <laughs> nine. No, these aren't real numbers. Uh, yeah, that's all. That's all we've got. So we'll see y'all next week. And until our next helping, adios, muchachos.